Now, our next guest, guest uh, Vincent Van Hook, spends his days right at the intersection of AI and robotics. He is a distinguished engineer at Waymo, um, which puts him at the wheel of autonomous driving innovation, quietly working towards making human drivers obsolete, or let's just say at least a little less prone to crashing into one another. Um, now, his career, I have to tell you, it, it reads like a, a greatest hits album of, of uh, AI achievements. He uh, pioneered deep learning at Google. He uh, led the famed Google Brain team. Uh, and he also founded Google's robotics research. And today, he is going to give us uh, some of the breakthroughs uh, and occasional speed bumps of self-driving technology. Vincent. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you for having um, me. Now, I think for anyone who hasn't been to the States or to California recently, they it may not realize just how prevalent these things are on the streets. I mean, they're properly working, aren't they? Yes, we are out there with cars in San Francisco, LA, uh, Phoenix, and Austin right now, and expanding rapidly to other locales. It's been fantastic to see the reception that the public has given to the technology. It was a big question mark, like would people actually want to sit in a, in a, in a robot taxi? Um, we, you know, I encourage everyone to use it. It's going to be the, the most exhilarating 10 minutes of your life. <laughs> and then after that, it's going to be the most boring ride <laughs> ever in the best way possible. Um, and we intend to make it as boring as possible forever. <laughs> and that's our goal. An amazing goal to have. Um, just tell me about the switch from you, from robotics to Waymo. When did you, when did you cross over? So I had been collaborating on and off with Waymo for a long time. I took my first Waymo rides doing donuts on a Google parking lot maybe like 10 years ago uh, when the project was still hush hush. Um, but I uh, only sort of switched it switched to Waymo last year. Mm. Um, there is a lot of in connections between AI and autonomous driving that are uh, becoming uh, a lot more prevalent. And we're also in a place now where the, so kind of the, the commercial aspects of the autonomous riding as there is, the technology aspects are increasingly dearest and it's, it's, it's a fantastic ride to be on. So, okay, I think that it feels like there was a very big leap forwards in terms of driverless cars, maybe about 10 years ago when, when those, you, know, you were doing donuts in the parking lot. Um, and then it sort of fell out of the headlines mm -hmm. a little bit for a while. And then it feels like recently there's been this other very big leap forward uh, giving, us, uh, giving us these cars. What, what, tell me about that. What, what changed? Yeah, so 10 years ago, there was this big deep learning revolution, right? And suddenly computer vision really started working. Um, and once computer vision was there, there was a feeling that you could basically build an autonomous driver uh, relatively quickly. Uh, as it turns out, you can build a, a competent driver relatively quickly, uh, but what this business or this environment needs is not just competent. You need to really have a, a superhuman driver if you want to succeed in the market. And so the, 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 ne the next years have been this slow and gradual realization, I think, across the industry that the, the, the magnitude of the challenge was not just to get the computer vision right, but to get the behavior right, to get uh, the long tail of problems right. And uh, driving is a, is a very social activity in many ways. There are other agents on the roads that happen to be people and that you have to interact with. It's not just a problem solving uh, in, a, you know, in like a rats in a maze. You have to actually take into account uh, the, 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 the social interaction aspects. And that's a big part of what we, uh, that makes, makes us successful. Well, well, talking about those social interaction aspects, how do you make sure in sort of 99.99, whatever it is, percent of cases, that, that all of the other road users are safe as well as the people in your car? Yeah, can we, we have a, yeah, we a have short a video. Can we cue it in? So this is an example of the things we see on the road and, you know. Uh, oh my gosh. <laughs> trigger warning, <laughs> I should have probably seen it before. Uh, so this is an example of, you know, somebody running a red light uh, in front of us. Uh, this is an example of somebody Ooh. falling off their scooter right in front of us. 
Um, and these are all real footage caught This is real footage of real uh, autonomous cars in deployment. There's somebody trying to uh, make, a, uh, make a, a turn, uh, somebody at night. Did you see that person? Oh my gosh. So imagine like this happens to you when you're driving. Right, uh, it, it would be a big event, right? It would be a big deal. You'd be talking about it like, oh my God, you know, what, what happened to me today? You know, I can't believe it. Um, we call this Tuesday, right? <laughs> uh, this is something that at the scale that we're operating at really happens all the time, very consistently, and we need to have a consistent response to it. So safety is a, is a, is a big topic. I'm gonna say something a little trite, but safety really starts with culture and like the people at Waymo are absolutely obsessed with safety. It's, it's their passion. Like we are a safety company that happens to be doing cars. Uh, the, the, the culture around safety, people scrutinize. You can be sure that every single one of these events has been scrutinized asking, is there a thing we could have done better? Is there a way of improving the system? And it's relentless and it's continuous. Um, from a more technical perspective, safety comes a lot from um, um, redundancy in many ways. So you want to have multiple layers of checks and balances throughout your system. Um, an example is uh, we have, for example, multiple sensors. Uh, we have cameras, we have LiDAR, uh, we have radar, and they all give you similar information, but different in very crucial ways, and it's kind of independent evidence of what's going on around the car, and that complementarity is a big deal, right? So if you're in fog, you can't really uh, necessarily lean on your camera nearly as much, the LiDAR is going to help you. At night, uh, you saw that car cutting off uh, from the distance, uh, knowing that there's a very distant car that's going fast and coming at you and being able to anticipate that, uh, way in advance is something that, for example, the, light, the, the radar can help you with. So the, the, the entire safety envelope really comes from redundant checks and uh, redundant validation of a lot of things. And that's why the, the engineering problem is a lot more than just you know, seeing what's on the road and reacting to it. There is a whole um, aspect uh, behind the scenes that really is about improving the long tail of problem, for, for the long tail of problems. But then again, I mean, those examples that you gave us, they were all other road users, right? People on scooters, bikes, whatever. Um, I was taking my daughters to school yesterday and there was uh, some ducklings mm -hmm. crossing the road. Um, how do you, I mean, because, because as you say, right, if you've got these cars out all the time, how do you deal with those really strange ed ca edge cases? Yeah, so the, the, we have edge cases all the time. And as we expand, you know, you, you, you do a million miles per week the things that happen once in a million happen once a week. Mm. You go to 10 million, the things that happen 10 times, uh, one in 10 million times happens every week. And so, and they might look very different. Right? Um, one of the strategy we've leaned on a lot is simulation. Uh, we run billions and billions of simulation all the time. And we're able to simulate the world with a very high degree of fidelity that enables us to essentially experience everything that we never want to experience on the road, right? We want to simulate all the events that we hope to never uh, ever see, or the situations where uh, the, 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 the car is put in, a, in, in, in very difficult scenarios that we cannot test in the real world. And um, so the, the, the example of duckling, uh, ducklings, uh, it, I would say it's barely an edge case anymore. Oh, really? right? Because uh, maybe not ducks, we don't see them very often, but animals crossing the streets, and uh, that happens all the time. We can model that, we can uh, learn how to deal with those situations in a completely safe you know, virtual environment, and then also validate that the simulation we're doing actually translates to the real world. We make sure that uh, what, we val what we simulate matches uh, the, what we observe in real conditions. So if that's the car's understanding, as it were, of what's going on around it, I mean, you also have to make decisions about how the car behaves. And, and I guess, um, you know, you wouldn't want a car to be completely altruistic to all road users to sort of yield to everything, otherwise it sort of wouldn't get anywhere. How do you, how do you balance that? 
Yeah, it, it, it turns out the safest place you can be is you want to be the, the middle of the road driver. You want to be the, the median driver, essentially. Um, not more timid than the average driver, not more aggressive. You want to be as inconspicuous as possible. Uh, it's a bit of a game theory uh, thing. You want to, the other road users to not treat you any differently as any other car and to completely meet essentially their expectations of what another car would do. Because when you do that, you're basically inserting yourself in this social environment in the way that is the least disruptive. Um, and so that's why actually learning how to be assertive uh, is a thing. We have to, you know, imagine you have multiple cars sort of coming at an intersection. You have to sort of negotiate and uh, you, you, you might, you know, physically nudge forward and test if, you know, is it your turn to go or is it the other uh, car that's going to go. Um, it turns out this is very much a kind of a, a physical conversation you're having with other road users where you're interacting with them. It's, it's a bit of a dialogue, but the dialogue of action. And literally, you know, some of the work that we're doing is about modeling those interactions as if they were a dialogue. Uh, very similar techniques as you would see in Gemini chatbot. Uh, the, instead of having people talking in turns, you have people acting in turns and many agents in a giant chat room that is the road. And uh, the, the techniques are very similar. The application of AI to those techniques is very similar in, in many ways. And so we can leverage essentially the, the growth and scale and improvements in performance in AI for the purpose of uh, better driving. Well, let me ask you about improvements then. Is there still headroom? Is there still a way to go? Yeah, there are still a lot of things that uh, you know, we're improving every day. Uh, an example is we haven't spent uh, too much time yet on uh, driving in the snow. A lot of our cities Doesn't right now. Doesn't happen that much in California. That's right, that's right. And uh, we know that it's uh, a thing that we have to improve if we want to go uh, further north. Snow is an interesting uh, challenge, right? It can be uh, pretty voluminous. It can reflect uh, LIDAR uh, in, in a way that uh, a regular road wouldn't. So improving on those kinds of uh, scenarios is, uh, is a big theme. Um, and again, just scaling up. Uh, the, the fleet brings new challenges that are just the, the, the long tail of rare scenarios that we, we had an example last year where just increasing the number of cars in our parking lots, in our depot where we go to have them in charge, um, at some point there was a critical mass of cars where they started honking at each other. Uh, <laughs> they, 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 they were just like interfering with each other negatively because the, there was just not, ever, not enough room, and they started, you know, thinking that you know the other car behind was trying to rear-end them or something, and so we had to deal with that, and we fixed it. Now our cars are a lot more silent and well-behaved in depot, but that's the kind of thing that you don't see uh, until you experience it. So they honk as well, then. <laughs> they do honk. Um, it's a safety thing um, when you have a car that's coming behind you at a certain speed and you project that they actually may collide with you. It might be that the person behind you is not paying attention. So we typically honk to just warn them that uh, something might happen. Amazing. Amazing. Um, I know you're in four cities at the moment. You've got um, uh, California. You're on the way to Japan as well. Are some cities easier than others, aside from the snow thing? Yes. Uh, we. You know, we started in Phoenix, Arizona, because it's flat and very regular and not very dense in, in many ways. So the roads are quite wide. The as well. roads are quite wide, so it was a very good test case. We immediately went to San Francisco, though, because that's one of the hardest cities in the U.S. You have lots of hills. It's actually the second densest city in the U.S. after New York. Um, and um, so we, we already have battle tested our driver on some of the most difficult roads in, in the US. Um, but in general, the driver we have found generalizes very well. That's why we're in this phase of now expanding to many, many more cities in the US. And we're starting to uh, stretch even more 
uh, overseas and trying to do data collection in Japan so that uh, we're, we're ready to uh, expand. We have to figure out how to do a left side driving uh, at some point. And so is, is the Japanese uh, project, is it an experimental one or is it, it rolled out commercially? It's not rolled out commercially. Right now we're in the um, information gathering phase, uh, trying to understand what is going to be hard about uh, translating what we're doing to Japan, different road rules, different practices, um, and uh, yeah, we're gonna be learning from that. But you do envision a future not very far away where these things are on roads all over the world. Yeah, I don't think there is any major technical roadblock, right? It's um, the, the, the technology, the core technology is very flexible. We, we really built a, a driver, uh, not a specific car or a specific, uh, just a ride, ride hailing service. We, we built a technology platform that is going to be uh, retargetable to different, uh, different cars, different uh, vehicles on the road, different environments. Um, and thus far, our expansion to new cities has been relatively smooth in the sense we didn't have to do a lot of extra work to go uh, to different, uh, to Austin or now um, um, Atlanta is, uh, is also the next in line. Well, let me finish by asking you um, about your robotics past. I, I wonder how many of the learnings from Waymo can then feed back into a similar revolution for robotics. I think there's a lot. Um, the main one may be patience, uh, <laughs> in the sense that uh, you know we had kind of solved the nominal normal driving several years ago, and then found that nominal driving, just driving the kind of driving that you do every day, is just not enough. You have to really uh, be much better and in all the tail cases and, and things like this. Um, Robotics is kind of still chasing its nominal use case, right? Uh, you, see, you see robots manipulating objects. Outside of a industrial setting, it's, uh, it's not quite there yet. And I, I, I have faith that in the next few years, we'll get to the point where robotics is capable of doing the things that you want the robot to do in a nominal setting and then all the hard things are gonna start, like all the difficult aspects of handling and turning that into a commercial product, I think is gonna start. So patience uh, is probably the main lesson. But an autonomous car is a very simplified robot, right? It's a robot with two degrees of freedom. You just go left, go right, accelerate, decelerate, right? And the, so the, 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 it's a robot, the, the conceptually it's the same thing, a lot of those things we are learning at Waymo can readily translate to the more complex setting of many degrees of freedom robotics. Amazing. You started off with driverless cars, ending on, and I'm going to translate you, robot butlers. That's, uh, that's essentially what I'm hearing. <laughs> Thank you so much, Vincent. Absolutely fascinating. Um, and I'm going to hand over to Debbie to close out another incredible zeitgeist. Thank you very much.